Now that we've covered individual computational units pretty comprehensively, we can begin to look at how to combine them. In this video, we'll examine that in the context of the XOR problem. I'll introduce the problem, work through a case example, and then provide some extra details about why it works. The main reason why neural networks are so powerful is because they're able to take a bunch of computational units, like the ones we learned about so far, and combine them together so that they all work together to solve some sort of greater task. This is useful because a lot of times, no matter how good our weights and activation function are, it's simply not possible to solve a problem using a single computational unit. A good example of this is the XOR problem, which you might have seen previously in other CS or circuit design classes. In case you haven't, the XOR function is basically a function that should produce a value of 1 if the two inputs are different from one another, or a value of 0 if the two inputs are the same. The truth table for doing that, versus performing the AND or OR functions, is shown here. It's possible to solve both the AND and OR problems using a single perceptron, which is a very rudimentary form of a computational unit, Rather than having a differentiable activation function, the perceptron activation just outputs a binary value depending on whether the input z value exceeds a threshold. We can see that here. If we want to compute AND, we just need to set the weights for our two inputs to 1, and the weight for the bias term to negative 1, and we've created a function that produces the same truth table values as what was shown on the previous slide. We can compute OR using an almost identical network, where we just substitute the weight for the bias term to 0 instead of negative 1. Again, this will produce values identical to what was shown in the truth table for OR. However, it's impossible for us to do the same thing with the XOR function, and that's because the function isn't linearly separable. With the AND and OR functions, we were just learning sets of weights that allowed us to draw a nice, clean hyperplane separating the positive and negative values. With XOR, no matter how many different sets of weights we try, we'll never come up with something that allows us to do this using a single computational unit. So instead, if we want to implement the XOR function using our computational units, we need to combine them into a larger network. Something like this, where we have a hidden layer with two units, followed by an output layer with a single unit, and we're using nonlinear ReLU activations. We can work through a case from our XOR truth table to verify that this works. So in this case, let's assume that we've already learned optimal weights for our network. So we've learned that the inputs to hidden unit number 1 should be weighted by values of 1, 1, and 0. The inputs to hidden unit number 2 should be weighted by values of 1, 1, and negative 1. And the inputs to output unit number 1 should be weighted by values of 1, negative 2, and 0. So now let's go ahead and set our input values to 0 and 1. And we want to see if sending these values through the network we've created will produce an output value of 1. So we'll multiply our inputs by the specified weights for each of the two hidden units, and we'll get values of 0, 1, and 0 for the first hidden unit, and values of 0, 1, and negative 1 for the second hidden unit. We'll sum up the values in each case, so we'll get a sum of 1 for the first hidden unit, and 0 for the second hidden unit. Then we'll run ReLU on both of those sums, so the maximum of 0 and 1 is going to be 1 for the first hidden unit, and the maximum of 0 and 0 is going to be 0 for the second hidden unit. We'll go ahead and pass those output values of 1 and 0 along to the next layer, which is our output layer that contains a single unit. We'll multiply our inputs to that unit by the respective weights of 1, negative 2, and 0. And we'll get values of 1, 0, and 0. We'll sum those up and we'll get a value of 1, which we'll pass into our ReLU function. The maximum of 0 and 1 is 1, so that means our output value will be 1. Now, I won't work through the other three cases in this video in the interest of time, but feel free to work through them on your own if you want. You'll find that in each case, we'll end up with an output value that matches what the truth table says we should have. The reason why this entire process works is that when we combine computational units, we actually end up creating new representations for our input values. 
we could consider the output from our hidden layer in this case as its own two-dimensional vector. In our case, the new representations learned by the hidden layer are linearly separable, and we can see that by plotting them here, where we're representing outputs of zero as zebras and outputs of one as unicorns. So we move from the unsolvable problem on the left to the easily solvable problem on the right. Now, for the sake of illustration, in this case, we just assume the weights that were shown in the example, and these are weights that are known to work with this problem. But in real world problems, we learn those weights automatically using a process called backpropagation, which often makes use of the gradient descent algorithm that we saw with logistic regression. This means that our network is able to learn a useful representation of the input training data on its own, which is in fact one of the key advantages of neural networks.